what I'm going to talk about are three very hot trends in HR right now that relate to human performance technology. But before I do that, this HPT thing, let me explain it. When you think of technology, what are some words that come to mind? Just yell them out. Difficult. What? Data. What else? When you think of technology. Internet. Good. Well, technology, the definition of it is machines and equipment that are developed from application of scientific knowledge. Wow, sounds pretty good. But that's the narrow definition. The broad definition is the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes. So that's the technology part. The performance part is a set of tasks, behaviors, processes, plus some desired results. And the human part are, are us. So you can have performance with technology, automated stuff, uh, but human performance technology is about how to use scientific knowledge to make your work better and make your lives better. So there's a whole bunch of snake oil out there right now that have really tripped people up and messed up some HR thinking. So I'm going to talk about three trends related to HPT. The first is HRBP. So what's the HRBP? Everyone, the human performance. It's a human, human resource business partner. So these are the, supposed to be the cream of the crop that do strategic work, that work with the executives and the head of the business. Well, in 1997, a guy named David Ehrlich started this off with a book called Human Resource Champions. So it's the foundation of, of all this stuff and got everyone thinking about this. So what, what happened was they, the, uh, the first HRBPs were generalists who are told, oh, by the way, now you have to work strategically, but you have to do generalist stuff. Okay, how, how well did that work? Guess what they spent most of their time doing? Generalist work, yeah, transactional, tactical stuff. And it didn't work, so some people got smart and said, you know what, let's change this. Let's take that transactional stuff away, away from these folks and have them just do strategy and working with the business partners and making, making, just making it from an HR perspective, a human perspective, making it better. Well, here's what didn't happen. It didn't work out quite that way. There's a Gardner study. 75% of chief HR officers, they say they really should be doing strategic work, these HRBPs. Less than 20% of them, according to these chief HR officers, are actually doing the strategic work. So what's wrong? And here, here's what's wrong with that. They don't have a methodology. They don't have an overarching process to help them do the kind of work that they're doing. So now we have 3.0. And this is where people, people have used that scientific knowledge part, the stuff that's been proven to work, to become very effective at working with their partners, their business partners, the executives, on how to do strategic work and helping them achieve their, uh, their objectives. So here's an example of a methodology. This is fairly new. It came out three weeks ago, but it's based on 80 years of research uh, from performance consulting and various other fields. And it's a way, if, it's a way of approaching a process and a process like, like that. So we're really good over here with the deliver part. Not so good with this and an, analyze stuff and clarify. People have a hard time about that. And this, these two boxes up here are pretty much the key. 
but that methodology is drives throughout that whole process. So when you when I talk to HRBPs, they say, yeah, yeah, we have a process. Um, we we work with centers of excellence or centers centers of experts to get work done. Yeah, they do all that real well, development stuff, but that's where they fall short. Short. Learning evolution. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. This is a guy named um, Donovan from uh, GP Strategies actually talked about this, and Mark goes up in a lot more detail. So I'm going to give you the highlights of it. Learning 1.0, traditional classroom stuff, right? From that, we get something, all this web 2.0 stuff came out. Now what happened when web 2.0 happened? All of a sudden, everyone wanted to take their classroom and convert them to web. And all of a sudden, you have all these web-based training courses that are page turners, that are not effective. I worked with a retail company, and an experienced cashier from a different retail store comes over to work for this retailer, goes through the training, and one week of web courses, and the eyes become blurry. She was afraid of touching a cash register. They didn't want to approach it because of the, it was just like overdone. But from after after we when we learned that it didn't work out so well, learning 2.0 came out. Now this is kind of cool. This is when you get into the social learning. You get into more collaboration, and you have you're you're pulling away from from that. Um, classroom type stuff and the web page turners and you're, they're thinking a little bit smarter so a lot of companies what they do is they do a lot of collaboration where someone has an idea they post it up on, on their collaboration site and people see that and that gets, that gets them going so you have push pull type content where it's generated from people and not from a training department so that's, that's what learning 2.0. Learning 3.0 is a little bit different. You're having a shift from command and control, compliance type stuff, to you're the learner, you're in charge of your learning. You have more autonomy and you have more choices in deciding how you're going to learn. So back to the HRBP example, it's up to you to be able to develop your own learning, but we'll provide stuff. In fact, we'll provide what they expect from different um, different jobs and show you how you can change other jobs. And you know, if you're not willing to learn and you're not willing to develop, that's okay. We'll find other people that'll do it for you, that'll do your job for you. You don't have to work here. So there's a lot more onus on the employees doing the work and the managers and the companies providing all the, the guidance for this. Last one is performance management. Let me get this out of the way. Forced ranking, where you line everyone up and say, you're the top, you're the bottom. It doesn't work. If you disagree with me, boo-hoo. You're wrong. <laughs> Stop it. Okay? It's, it may work for the short term, but they found in the long term, it absolutely doesn't work. So how many of you love performance reviews? Just a quick show. Come on, show of hands. No? Okay, one of you. When I worked in, a, I was doing an analysis project at a company, and was working in the HR department, there was all this moaning and groaning and crying and whining. I was like, well, guys, what's going on? Like, performance review time. But you're HR. The only person that loved performance reviews was the admin that ran the system. He loved it. It was a great system, but it didn't work. It didn't work for all the people. How about this? Or this. One of the things that they, there's two things that, that they found out when you do performance reviews where you give someone a number, like uh, one to five, five is great, and three is supposed to be really good, 
But um, what happens is when you assign numbers, the re research shows it causes disengagement. I mean, how many of you want to be a three or a four? Well, there's always going to be someone better. And it really affects collaboration. And they found in um, various other categories where it's been really harmful. The other thing is, remember the talk about growth mindset and fixed mindset? This type of performance review, it promotes a fixed mindset. Oh, I'm a, I'm a three. I'll always be a three. So what a lot of companies, uh, they're really having struggling with this thing. And the amount of time and effort is not giving an ROI. There's no return on it. At Accenture, just to give you an example about time, there's 375,000 employees there. They spend, according to the chief HR officer, 2 million hours on performance reviews. Okay, that sounds like a lot. It averages out to 5.4 or something like that. But imagine if you're a supervisor of a call center, you have 20 people. How many hours is done? So you have all this lost productivity. And what companies have found, and when we do the panel, you can ask more questions about it. What companies have found is you separate the pay and incentive part of it to focus on development. And you don't do it once or twice a year. It becomes a continuous process. Companies like Microsoft, Google, have done away with their performance reviews from the traditional sense, and they switched it to helping people develop and becoming better. It's a much more positive conversation, and it avoids all that conflict. Now, you can't totally do away with performance reviews because people are going to want pay and incentives, and that's where, if you read the literature, if you check out uh, all the articles being written, there's a lot of talk about how do you handle that. So those are the three things, HRBP, learning, and performance management. Thank you.